Good evening and welcome to you all. It is a great pleasure to celebrate tonight the 15th annual Brain Meyer Verhen lecture and particularly to celebrate it with Madame Aldegonde de Brenning Meyer Verhen and Mr. Martin Brenning Meyer, Professor Alexander Evers, and Professor Philip Ranches, Director of the Cardinal Bea Center for Judaic Studies of the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, and with our guests, students, and colleagues. Over the past 50 years, the center has developed and implanted its activities in the life of our, our faculty and beyond, and continue the cooperation with our sister center in Rome, exchanging professors, teachers, and students. In this program of exchange, we are happy to welcome tonight Professor Alexander Evers, our guest speaker, and the students from Rome. In the program of exchange of teachers, we are enthusiastic about the upcoming <coughs> of Professor Pino De Lucci next semester. He will teach a seminar on Jesus in Christian, Jewish, and Islamic traditions. Already about 40 BA students enrolled to this seminar, and I was obliged to close the registration. There is no doubt that it will be one of the significant and inspiring seminars dealing with the comparative aspect of religion in our faculty. I would like mainly to stress the importance of the encounter between our students and in this seminar and the various Christian communities. Professor Pino walks in the footsteps of Cardinal Martini's model of friendship toward the Hebrew University and keeps his humanistic and open spirit toward us. As in the past, the center continues to enhance its academic activity also at the international level. I am glad to let you know that the proceedings of the International Conference of the Association of Patristic Studies held in Jerusalem in June 2013 are coming out soon. 700 pages of great scholarships dealing with the state of patristic studies in the 21st century all over the world. Next week, another important event sponsored by the center will take place. That is the Conference on Palestinian Christian Identity in Israel, and you will receive the invitation soon. This conference is organized by Dr. Merav Mark, she is here tonight, and Professor Gabi Horenchik from the Department of Education. As you know, last year we launched a program of postdoctoral fellowships. Dr. Flavia Ruani and Dr. Joseph Sancho organized the first international postdoctoral workshop of the center, a wonderful workshop, <coughs> which took place last May in 2014. This two-day workshop brought together well-established scholars and young researchers from Israel and United States, Canada, Italy, Germany, and France, who specialized in the fields of late antiquity and history of religion. We are very happy about the three scholars to be awarded the fellowship this year. Once again, Dr. Joseph Emmanuel Santo, this is his second year, Dr. Irene Panu, and Dr. Tamara Patarizzi. They will organize the second international postdoctoral workshop, which will take place in September and will focus on the therapeutic language, languages and images in Christian literature. As director of the center these last four years, I do feel that the center has fulfilled many of its initial goals, yet the mission is not complete. It is time for new visions and new horizons and maybe for a new director. In the next two years, the center will be involved in two international projects. The first concerns the very successful website of Syriac bibliography, created and maintained by Dr. Sergei Minov, who is now in Oxford. 
The center has been invited by Georgias Press, together with the universities of Princeton and Oxford, to foster collaboration between digital research projects in Syriac studies in order, in order to link projects together. This is really wonderful for us. The second concerns the Oreginiana, which will take place in two years in Jerusalem and will be about origin in Palestine, the man and his legacy in three cities, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Caesarea. These two huge projects demand not only financial support and academic ambition. Above all, one should have a clear vision about the center in the next decade, as well as a lot of energy and help. Our partner in all these enterprises is the Burning Meyer Ferhan family, which continues to guide and inspire us and deepen their support. Thanks to your generosity, the center is offering this year 14 scholarships, three for postdoc, two for PhD students, nine for MA, among them two from Rome. I am very proud of our students' achievements, and in their name, I wish to express our appreciation and thanks to the Brenningmeyer family. <laughs> and now it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Alexander Evers, the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs of Loyola University, <laughs> Chicago, and John Felix Rome Center in the University of Roma First. Professor Evers is the director of an important international research project which concerns the Collectio Avellana, a compilation of 244 imperial, papal, and senatorial letters and documents from the fourth to the sixth century. His main interest is late antique Eastern Western Christian history, the relationship of emperor and bishops, imperial policy in North Africa, and the Sea of Rome. His publications include Church, Cities, and People, a study of the plebs in the church and the cities of Rome, of Rome and Africa, 2010. He is also the co-editor of Power and Politics in Late Antiquity, Emperors, Bishops, and Senators in the Collectio Avellana. Professor Evers has also published on the Sea of Rome, as well as articles on Augustine, or for example, Augustine on the Church against the Donatist, a topic <laughs> with which he will deal tomorrow in our seminar. Tonight, he will be speaking on Game of Thrones, East and West, Constantinople, and Rome. Please. Shalom. <laughs> I was uh, six when my primary school teacher, Sister Virginie, taught us a song in Hebrew which got stuck in my mind and my heart. And with it uh, grew a fascination for the Holy Land, for a land of milk and honey, for the Holy City, for Jerusalem. And now finally, uh, not so long after finishing primary school, I'm in <laughs> Jerusalem for the very first time of my life. And it is a great honor, a privilege, to be here today. Uh, and thanks to the enormous vision, generosity, and support of Mrs. Brennigmeyer Verhan and your husband also, and Mr. Martin Brennigmeyer, um, to allow me to come to Jerusalem and speak to you here before you today, um, which is tremendous. The song I will not burst out into singing. I will <laughs> maybe tell you at the end of this lecture. Um, but there we are. Um, a thank you to the university here, to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, uh, to the Dean of the Humanities Faculty, but of course a great uh, thank you to my very distinguished colleague, Bruria, uh, for the invitation to come here. And uh, I have still very fond memories of our first encounter in Rome, uh, which set us on a journey and uh, a friendship which I hope will last forever. Thank you to Father Philip Rentius, uh, director of the Cardinal Bayer Center uh, in Rome for the study of uh, for Judaic studies in Rome, 
um, a friend, a brother almost, but thank God I'm not a Jesuit, um, and <laughs> who's a great inspiration, not just to me, but also to the many students of the John Felicia Rome Center uh, of Loyola University Chicago in Rome. So thank you very much. Uh, the daunting prospect for him right now is that I'm actually his boss since the 1st of January. So there we are. But thank you <laughs> also, Philip. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Where's Daniel? Daniel Shalem, for all the help uh, that you uh, put in this whole enterprise to get me over uh, from Rome to Jerusalem. But thank you all for being here this evening. And um, I hope you don't run away. So. Um, the Game of Thrones. Uh, it's time for a game, yes. I hope you're not disillusioned by the title. Uh, you may have high expectations of novels, of series, of everything. I've never read the books. I've never seen the TV series. Uh, I have no idea what they're about, but I just thought Game of Thrones, very, very appropriate for this evening's topic. Um, it's a reoccurring theme, constantly. A best-selling tale of two cities, of two thrones, of two power structures, and the respective individuals within them, on them, at the two helms. The following is the tale of a struggle between the emperors in Constantinople and the bishops of Rome, the popes, or, question, can we call them popes already? A tale that becomes apparent through the documents in the so-called Collectio Avalana, and Buria, you mentioned it already. Uh, I hope it's not going to be too tedious and too boring, but there's an entire list of all the documents in your handout, so you can follow. Once I mention numbers, uh, we're going to be jumping backwards and forwards a little bit, but at least you know what those documents entail, and also where you can find them. Hopefully, very soon, in the not-so-very-far future, also in English, translated and with a historical commentary. We're working on that. Mm -hmm. Um, the Collectio Avalana. I would like to argue here that the Collectio is a conscious attempt of the bishops of Rome to take the lead in matters of faith, but probably, potentially, also in everything else that went on both within and outside the walls of the church. <coughs> a bid for the formerly imperial title of Pontifex, and not even Maximus. But Pontifex must be seen, I believe, as a serious step into the right direction. And collecting textual evidence of the spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome, such as in the Collectio Avalana, is yet another step. But here we go. Once upon a time in the East, one man wrote to another man in the West, and this is your first passage on your handout. It is fitting that God's marvelous deeds are revealed to many, but most of all to the supreme pontiffs. That is the reason why we declare to your holiness through these holy letters that first through the favor of the inseparable Trinity and subsequently through the choice of the most noble foreman of our sacred palace and of the most sacred senate and surely also of our exceedingly brave army we have been elected and confirmed emperor. Even though we did not want it and had refused it. We pray therefore that you with your holy prayers plead the divine power in that the beginning of our imperium will be strengthened. For it is fitting for us to hope as such and for you to fulfill it. Given on the 1st of August in Constantinople during the consulate of the most distinguished Lord Magnus, the year 518. There's an awful lot going on here. Uh, in the new Emperor Justin's letter to Pope Hormisdas, the Bishop of Rome, there's a lot of holiness. Your holiness, holy letters, holy prayers, then a serious, what I would like to call, flirtation with the pontificate. And last, but certainly not least, quite the overt mission statement, through the inseparable trinity. Next, the man is to respond, Hormizdas. No date given, but surely shortly after the imperial letter had arrived in Rome, Hormizdas wrote, O oh, most glorious son, your second passage in the handout, 
The Catholic Church transmits as a gift its congratulations at the beginning of your venerable reign, through which it is confident that after such a great fatigue of discord, it finds the tranquility of peace. And there's no doubt that you have come to the highest power through the heavenly providence, so that the injustice which for so long in all parts of the East has been forced upon the religion will be abolished. You have attributed the beginning of your imperium to the blessed apostle Peter, which we, for this reason, have devotedly accepted. As we believe that through you, without any doubt, there will be very soon be the unity of the churches. God, who allowed your sentiments of piety, the desire to address us because of the sincere service of his religion to his religion, will himself offer his affection as we wish for it. You have indicated that the burden of Imperium has been imposed upon you, although you did not want it and rejected it. But this way, it is clear that you have been elected by heaven's judgment. According to what the Apostle said, there is no power but through God, but those who have it have been ordained by God. It remains, thus we believe, that you, as you are elected by God, stretch out your hand over the church, which you see laboring on in consolation. Let them seize that obstruct its peace. Let them rest that in the disguise of shepherds attempt to disperse Christ's flock. Their judgment shall firm up the powers of your rule because where God is rightly worshipped, adversity shall have no ground. We have not omitted to send this page with congratulations through the Holy Lord Alexander, hoping that with the help of our God, through the Holy Lord and our son Gratus, we may offer to your clemency the answer to the singularities which concern the unity of the church. Again, quite a lot going on. Most importantly, you have attributed the beginning of your imperium to the blessed apostle Peter which we, for this reason, have devotedly accepted. Quite a humble chap, our home is thus. We are Peter. And thus, the correspondence between Emperor Justin in Constantinople and Pope Hormizdas in Rome, Pope, can we call him Pope, kicks off. And you can find it all in the Collectio Avalana. We will get back to these two distinguished gentlemen writing backwards and forwards in just a little bit. But first things first, the Collectio Avalana. Back in 1945, the Flemish canon lawyer Alphonse van Hover summarized the significance of the Collectio as follows. The author is unknown, or rather the compiler. And it appears as a fairly unorganized heap of text. But at least, van Hover said, few exceptions, most of them are authentic. The Collectio Avalana surely is one of the most interesting and intriguing collections of correspondence and other documents from the period of late antiquity. 244 letters, decrees, and edicts, ordinances, and memoranda, mainly flowing forth from the imperial court at Constantinople and the episcopal headquarters of Rome, can provide a profound insight into the dealings of emperors and popes in the period between 367 66 and 553 CE. The main thread of the collection clearly is one of heresy and schism, the many issues and conflicts that the church, as well as the Roman Empire, continue to face in the course of almost two centuries, feature prominently in the Collectio. Starting with the events surrounding the election of Damases, very famous as Bishop of Rome, in October of the year 366, resulting in the Orsinian Schism and covering the time period up until shortly after the Second Council of Constantinople in 553, the Collectio yields a pretty neat cross-section of unorthodox beliefs over the course of almost 200 years. Its purpose, however, is far less from clear, far less clear, sorry. Whoever took the initiative in the first place to bring all these pieces together still remains in the dark, as does any possible intent behind it. The identity of the actual collector has so far always remained unknown. Questions about the unity of the collectio have been asked frequently and incessantly. Answers vary from none whatsoever 
to partly, to actually designed as a complete body of text at the time of its compilation. Its authenticity of individual documents as well as that of the Collectio as a whole have been an issue from time to time. However, Van Hoven already said few exceptions there, most of them are authentic. If anything, the Collectio is an invaluable dossier of both papal and imperial history, indicating that the relationship between Constantinople in the East and Rome in the West, between emperors and bishops, still was an extremely lively but also rather complicated one. Here starts a pretty boring part, but bear with me, just one page, I'll race through this. The modern edition, not boring at all, look at your list, there we are. The modern edition of the Collectio was published in 1895 and 1898, two volumes, huge volumes, by Otto Günther. Spanning a period of almost 200 years, the earliest piece, as I said, uh, dates back to 367, but it refers to events in 366, is a rescript of the Emperor Valentinian I. And the latest is a letter that Pope Vigilius, and that's actually Collectio Avalana number five on your long, long list. The last one is a letter that Pope Vigilius wrote to Emperor Justinian I on the 14th of May, 553 CE, Collectio Avalana 83. The name Avalana was given to the Collectio by the famous Ballerini brothers after a Vatican manuscript, Vat Reg Lat 4961, which originated from the library of the monastery of Santa Croce in Fonta Avalana in Umbria. And if you're ever looking for a holiday destination, that's it. It's beautiful, <laughs> absolutely beautiful. At first glance, the collection does appear as an unorganized whole its relevance hidden in the fact that the majority of the documents had only been preserved here. Only very few of them have parallels elsewhere. The first, first 13 texts are all dealing with the schism of Orsinus in the initial years of Damas's reign as the Bishop of Rome, 366 and 367, as well as some of its consequences. Documents 14 to 37 concern the troubles and the breakup between Eulalius and Boniface in 418 and 419. Emperor Honorius wrote a letter to his colleague Arcadius in Constantinople on the violent acts against John Chrysostom, document 38, <coughs> followed by two letters of the usurper, a wannabe Emperor Maximus, texts 39 and 40. Four letters written by Pope Innocent I, 41 to 44. Six pieces dating to the time of the pontificate of Zosimus on the issue of Pelagianism, 45 to 50. And five letters from the pen of Pope Leo I, all dating to the year 460. They've only been preserved here, these letters from Leo. Followed, letters by Leo, followed by documents 56 to 78 all these pontificates, you can read them, you can see them, I'll skip them, um, to finally the second volume of the entire Collectio Avalana, the second volume by Günther, is entirely dedicated to the letters and documents from the pontificate of Hormisdas. A world famous Bishop of Rome, from 514 to 523 CE, a man who changed the world. Perhaps, perhaps not. The first one to try to make sense of the whole Collectio and also to distinguish any subdivisions was the German scholar Friedrich Maaßen. He recognized six distinct parts. I won't go through all six of them, not to worry. Günther, shortly after the publication of his first volume, said there were five subdivisions, huge relevance. But in any case, he um, compiled uh, different subdivisions uh, of uh, a set of schisms saying that the place of origin, for example, um, there's a whole set 41 to 50, they all come from the archives of Carthage, probably the Bishop of Carthage um, and his archives, these documents found their way to Rome. Günther was convinced that the whole collectio was far from a miscellaneous gathering of material. He clearly saw the hand of an editor, a scholar even, 
who had brought all the material together around the middle of the 6th century CE, the time of Pope Vigilius, compiled from various archives, Rome, Africa, uh, the bishop's archive in Rome, but also the senators and the senate's archive and that of the prefect of the city of Rome. Gunther argued that the opening section of his own modern edition must have been an integral part prior to being included in the Collectio. The documents on the schisms of Ursinus and of Boniface most likely come from the archives of the Praefectus Urbi in Rome and could easily have been the starting point for the collector, whoever he may have been. There are enough indications and internal comments and suggest, that suggest a careful organization as well as a coherent editorial policy. Gunther also argued very much in favor of a 6th century composition, and this is important, the 6th century composition of the Collectio as a whole, shortly after the date of its latest document, the letter of Virgilius to the Emperor. Kate Blair Dixon already indicated recently that this provides us with a clear terminus post quem for the Collectio. The only certain terminus ante quem is established by the two manuscripts from the 11th century now kept in the Vatican Library. It is practically impossible to understand what happened or indeed did not happen in the intermediate period between the 6th and the 11th centuries. At this point, it is recommendable still to follow Gunther in his convictions. Someone must have had good reasons back in the 6th century to compile a corpus of testimonial accounts of tensions between the bishops of Rome and the emperors at Constantinople. Whoever it may have been that gave the order to collect or who carried out the actual collection, if such a distinction can be made, they or he must have regarded the collectio as a vehicle to arrive at a very specific destination. Dalmont, in a recent article, argued that the unedited character of the assembled and transmitted texts make it plausible that the principal objective of the compiler must have been to complement and complete documentation that could already be found in various collections elsewhere in use and circulation. At a time when the papacy experienced a serious crisis of authority and representation back in the 6th century, it is not unlikely that all these pieces were brought together to constitute an apologetic dossier for the See of Peter at Rome. Such a dossier could seek to establish and safeguard the primacy of Rome in the face of a growing hegemony of Constantinople and the Oriental metropolitans. And its values and virtues as such, of course, albeit in different contexts in time and of usage, would certainly not have escaped ecclesiastical attention during the Middle Ages, when papal authority repeatedly found itself in times of trouble. Dalmont does not plea for composition of the Collectio at this point in time, however, the later medieval point in time, for such political reasons, church political reasons, around the time of Pope Gregory VII, for example. She concludes that it clearly belongs to the category of primitive canonical collections. Contrary to the future collections of medieval times, organized in a structured way in methodical rubrics, the collections of late antiquity in general are far from models of homogeneity. And it is difficult to perceive any notion of an editor in terms of chronology, documents of the most varied provenance and disparate genres are, gen are generally hardly ordered, or not ordered at all. Conciliar texts, pontifical decrees, synodal letters, legal texts, both profane and canonical, patristic treatises and other varie, statutes, symbols, lists of popes, lists of bishoprics, classified per, 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 per province, <laughs> Apoc apocryphal writings find a destination which at first might not appear logical in any sense, but so far the collectio. Let us return to the correspondence between Justin and Hormizas. On Anastasia's death, 90 years young, in 518, it was more than apparent 
The Henoticon of Emperor Zeno, dated to 482, had failed. Originally intended as an attempt to find the middle way between the two extremes of complete and utter loyalty to the Council of Chalcedon of 451 and complete and utter rejection of it, the Henoticon had not been able to maintain its ground. Its comprehensiveness, initially appearing as its strength, had turned out to be its greatest weakness. Relying on ambiguity about Chalcedon, it never defined a distinctive position between the two extremes. The opposed factions were perfectly able to use adherence to the Henoticon as a cloak under which they could continue to fire at will at each other. With Justin, the Henoticon was finally abandoned. It was replaced, eventually, by a papal libellus, which was quite different in its function. The libellus of Ormizdas, Pope from 514 to 523, as already mentioned, the libellus of Hormizdas did not try to point out the tradition shared by the rival groups. It demanded the subjection of all groups to the faith of the apostolic see of Rome. The enforcement of the papal libellus created a sharp division, which had been blurred before by the Henoticon, between Chalcedonians who accepted it and non-Chalcedonians who chose exile. Traditionally, Justin has always been regarded as a convinced Chalcedonian. There's no evidence, however, which suggests that the emperor had been anything of that kind before coming to power. He sided with Chalcedonians after he had taken possession of the imperial throne, but this does not prove that he had been one beforehand. After his accession, his nephew Justinian, later on emperor from 527 to 565, praised in a letter to the Pope Justin's, and I quote, most ardent zeal for the orthodox religion. And letters written by the Pope and the Patriarch of Constantinople referred in passing to Justin's work for the unity of the churches before he became an emperor. However, these letters might very well all be more of the flattering kind, and therefore not strictly representative of the emperor's character and actions. Justin and his nephew, Justinian, were Illyrians, probably from a peasant background. It is always implied that these Illyrian origins, regarded as Western origins, made him inclined to Chalcedon. As the Balkans had been devastated by invasions of Huns since 447, many people tried to escape the subsequent rural poverty. Young Justin came to Constantinople around 470, when he was 20 years old, and joined the army. He received no education, and it is not unlikely that before his arrival at the capital, his only exposure to Christianity might have been baptism. It is not out of the ordinary that he took the route to Constantinople. Rome was far away and under the control of barbarians, whereas Constantinople was the center of the world. The Illyrian Count Marcellinus wrote a short chronicle in the year 519, dealing with the period between 379 and 518. He updated it in 534, and an anonymous writer later on filled in the events until 548. Directed towards an Illyrian audience in Constantinople, the chronicle reveals a strong Illyrian identity, which included an enduring attachment to the West partly expressed in the use of Latin and a positive attitude towards the Bishop of Rome, and ideally his supremacy. Nevertheless, Justin's, and later also Justinian's, Illyrian origins can hardly be counted as strong evidence for an alleged Chalcedonian persuasion. Illyrian generals at this time led armies but were also informed and involved in theological and religious policy at the highest level. This, however, the information of these generals, should not lead to the conclusion either that they displayed a strong conviction on either side, Chalcedonian or non-Chalcedonian. 
it seems far more likely that someone like Justin could make a career under a non-Chalcedonian emperor and be entrusted with troops to defend the city because he was either inclined to the faith of the emperor <coughs> or actually presented himself as completely indifferent to the religious controversies. When Anastasius died in 518, he had not made any arrangements for his succession. A new emperor had to be chosen, and so a bag of money was given to Justin to, if necessary, bribe the Senate to have the Chamberlain of the Imperial Court appointed as the new emperor. On the 10th of July, 518, Justin, also a Chamberlain, not specifying which Chamberlain, Justin was crowned emperor in the Hippodrome at Constantinople. As a result of a series of events, developments, and various circumstances, amongst which even potential fraud and the appropriation of funds to secure his own election to the imperial throne, Justin found himself in strong opposition to the non-Chalcedonian party at court. Headed by Amantius, another Chamberlain under Anastasius, and part of the network of Severus, the former Palestinian monk and now Bishop of Antioch. At the same time, in Thrace, the Chalcedonian Goth Vitalian was still heading an army ready to march against Constantinople should the new emperor denounce Chalcedon. Justin had most possibly to gain politically by siding with the Chalcedonians. The patriarchs of Constantinople had traditionally adhered to Chalcedon before 512, although they had no longer been recognized by Rome since the Henoticon in 482. <coughs> Timothy, the patriarch from 511 to 518, had performed a constant balancing act between the Chalcedonian monks on the one and Emperor <coughs> Anastasius on the other hand. Having sided with the Chalcedonians, it was in Justin's, Justin's interest to restore communion with Rome. And perhaps Vitalian's presence, or rather that of his army just outside the gates, might have had something to do with it. Rome's prestige was high among the Chalcedonians in the East. The schism as a result of the Henoticon had not been undisputed, and Eastern Chalcedonians had looked to Rome for possible answers communicating with the Pope, or Bishop. Papal backing from Rome was crucial for any Chalcedonian Emperor. On top of this, a reunion with the Pope could give Justin's reign more legitimacy and would strengthen his position. Justin sent a letter to Hormizdas, <coughs> informing him of his election and thus opening the communication between Rome and Constantinople, calling him Pontifex. To the Supreme Pontiff we communicate. Previously an imperial title, it had been the Emperor Gratian who had renounced the title in 382. On your handout you find a fragment from the new history of Zosimus, where Zosimus gives us the only account we have of the renunciation by Emperor Gratian of the imperial title Pontifex Maximus. Discussion is still going whether the emperor actually renounced it or whether nothing changed at all. Ever since 382, presuming that the emperor had renounced the title, ever since 382, Pontifex had been up for grabs. From time to time, we can see the occasional attempts of the bishops of Rome to kidnap the imperial title. But there is absolutely no consistency. At only very few instances, in the case of only very few individuals, Damasus in the 4th century, Leo in the 5th, and now Hormizdas in the 6th, we see an attempt of the bishop of Rome to obtain some formal status and recognition equal to the imperial highest religious rank of the Roman Empire from Augustus to Gratian. An attempt, it didn't stick. 
Homizdas responded. With all the formalities out of the way in the two letters at the beginning, Your Holiness, I'm the new sheriff in town, O oh, most glorious son, well done, the communication took off. In September, on the 7th of September, September 518, Justin informed Homizdas of the steps he was taking to end the schism, Collectio Avalana 143, to which Homizdas, of course, had to respond again. Very dry, very short, Thanks, that's great. Negotiations between Rome and Constantinople continued, went on throughout the winter, and resulted in the dispatch of papal legates to the imperial capital in January 519. The libellus of Hormizdas, which was presented to bishops in Illyricum for signature en route, contained the names of those who would have to be formally denounced before communication could be restored between Rome and Constantinople. This document laid the foundation for the final separation of the non-Chalcedonians as it defined on which terms Chalcedon should be enforced in the East. It demanded, among other things, that the non-Chalcedonian and Chalcedonian patriarchs of Constantinople, Antioch and Alexandria, after 482, needed to be condemned because they had accepted the Henoticode the Henoticon, and had therefore not been in communion with Rome. John, the Patriarch of Constantinople, was practically forced to sign the Libellus on the 28th of March, 519. By signing it, he condemned his predecessor Timothy and all other Patriarchs since 482. The names of the Patriarchs, as well as the names of the Emperors Zeno and Anastasius, were erased from the diptychs <laughs> of the churches in Constantinople. Whereas in Constantinople, the crowds enjoyed the newly established communion with Rome, and according to the papal laggards, gathered in greater numbers than ever before, problems concerning the libellus and its enforcement elsewhere soon reached the capital. In the autumn of 519, the metropolitan Dorotheus of Thessaloniki sent large amounts of money to Constantinople probably in order to instigate opposition. He sent so much that, according to a papal legate, it could even blind angels. <laughs> Dorotheus also caused a bloody incident in Thessaloniki, in which a bishop sent by the pope was severely injured and some servants died. Emperor Justin needed to take heed and carefully consider what he could realistically push through and so the enforcement of the libellus took longer than the Pope might have wished and hoped for. In this libellus, Pope Homizdas claims that the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, may not be ignored, is proven by the result, because in the apostolic see, religion has always been kept immaculate. Thus, Hormizdas claims the Gospel of Matthew, Peter as the rock of the church, as well as an orthodox past for Rome ever since the time of the apostles. He puts himself in this tradition, anathematizing all heretics. With the accession of Justin in 518, and with the acceptance of Chalcedon in Constantinople, the winds changed. Hormizdas acted prudently. He answered the emperor politely, but at the same time, did let him know that the acceptance of his libellus was his requirement for communion between Rome and Constantinople. And the rest is ancient history. The tone in the correspondence between Justin and Hormizdas is simple and straightforward. Documents, here's the list, 141 to 144, 149, 160, 168, 181, 192, 193, 201, 202, 232. All those documents, all those letters state the same thing. One could almost speak of pontifical stalking. Justin was continuously reminded and requested to accept Chalcedon and also the treaties of Leo and to announce his, this change of religious policy officially in all provinces of the empire. Hormizdas must have desperately desired the combination of imperial law and his libellus. 
all the bishops responsible for all the clergy in their dioceses throughout the empire should sign the papal libellus with the sacra generalis, the imperial letter accompanying it, it made the Pope's request legally binding for all the subjects of the Roman Empire. <coughs> Clever chap, who missed us. What had happened in 482, in the case of the Henoticon, was that a definition of faith had been imposed by imperial edict. The papacy, or at least the Bishop of Rome, now used the same tool to strike back. From a papal perspective, the difference was that the papacy had the auctoritas, to declare what the right faith was, whereas the emperor only had the potestas to enforce it. All bishops should sign the libellus as my profession which I have signed with my own hand and offer to thee, Hormizdas, holy and venerable pope of the city of Rome, pledging allegiance to the bishop of Rome. By implementing the libellus together with an imperial edict, the faith of Rome was unquestionably accepted and thereby the primacy of Rome established also in the East. It was more than a general council could ever have possibly done for the Bishop of Rome for the papacy. Until Homiznas died. In conclusion, it has been argued that the completeness of the triumph had been largely due to the Emperor Justin. Omizas, however, suddenly had his fair share, if not, I would say, a bigger piece of the cake, cleverly engineered. At the opportune moment, Hormizdas took an important step along the long road towards some sort of primacy of the Cathedra Petri. <coughs> Barely existing before, not at all recognized by the other patriarchs within Christendom, the political and religious circumstances of the empire allowed our man in Rome to move. That is most certainly also the reason that so many of his letters, as well as the epistles addressed to him, are included in the Collectio Avalana. In fact, as I said, all of the second volume. It is clear that the various subdivisions in the Collectio were created in their own time, their own place, and to their own specific purpose, until they were finally collected by one man who had his own reasons to do so, which must have been after 553, the year of Virgilius' last letter to Justinian. It is important to take into account the nature and origin of all the documents concerned. The majority of them seem to come from papal archives kept at the Lateran in Rome. It also appears that the papal scrinium had started to keep regesta, or copy volumes, which began to serve as blueprints for the papal correspondence. As for our collectio, Gunther, after having argued that it was a sixth century document, also argued that it could not have been a formal collection of documents to be published and copied, to be distributed all over the known world. Perhaps, so Gunther says, the collector might have had the intention of doing so, but the rough form in which it has come down to us was certainly not suitable for publication. And so Gunther regarded the whole show as a private enterprise of a scholar who happened to live in Rome at the time of Agilius, collecting all the material out of his own personal interest, using the papal scrinium and other archives and putting it together as it has come down to us a collector, a man with a hobby, a rather large stamp collection, a train spotter. <laughs> Highly unlikely, I would say. Eckhard Wilbel, already in 1993, suggested a connection between all the documents in the Collectio and the collector's own time. All of the documents in the first two subdivisions on your long list again, refer to internal conflicts within the Roman Church, drawing on contemporary documentation. The other parts of the collection clarify Rome's position in schism and debates, or rather that of the Bishop of Rome. Wilberauer sees as the reason of its existence that the Collectio was compiled as a result of the next major conflict after Eulalius and Boniface, namely that of Sigmachus and Laurentius from 498 to 514. 
there's one minor downside to this conclusion. There are texts that date from after 514. Wilbur Auer interprets all these later texts as later additions, unordered and erroneous. In his view, it is a collection of, a rather, of rather disparate elements, and there is no logic to bringing the various sections in one single corpus after 553. Highly unlikely again, I would say. Most recently, Kate Blair Dixon expressed that the compiler of the Avalana showed a great interest in schisms. True. Here lies the crux. Schisms and heresies continued for a rather long time, which meant that orthodoxy had to be patient with them. Christianity saw a world full of many Christendoms. Orthodoxy had not been established. The authority of the church was still trying to find its roots. And in this search, the past could and would often help. The Collectio Avalana is an exponent of the search for authority and for the establishment thereof. One could argue that it stands in a long tradition if one thinks, for example, of the appendices to the work of Optatus of Mylevis in his battle against Donatism. More tomorrow. There, episcopal letters and decrees were collected and cited in order to establish the authority. Whose authority? The authority of the Church of Rome. These very documents here in the Collectio Avalana are used to, arc to achieve exactly the same thing. The various ecumenical councils had not brought the desired unity, that's clear to all of us, at least desired by some parties within the church. East and West were sometimes strongly divided. In the East, we have the wise and erudite philosophers and rhetors, counselors to the emperors in Constantinople, men of power and might. In the West, the men who held the see of the Apostle Peter, who believed that they deserved more. And so letters of support from the imperial power, the emperor, were perhaps considered to contribute to more. Letters to and from Africa, from the Bishop of Carthage, to and from some of the most influential leaders of the church in the West in the 4th and 5th centuries also. And why compile it all at the particular point in time shortly after 553. Perhaps because the influence of the East was felt stronger again in the West after the Byzantine Reconquista, the secular power of the emperor in Constantinople, the spiritual authority of the patriarchs of the East, political and religious circumstances forced the church in the West to move, forced our collector to collect. Train spotting with a reason. I promise you a song. Uh -huh. I will not sing. I will just say Shalom Chaferim, Shalom Chaferim, Shalom, Shalom. Leitraut, Leitraut, Shalom. Thank you very much, Professor Evers, for introducing to us this important collection. We have time for questions, so the floor is open. Chalcedonian, mm -hmm. but let's say if Alexandria at that point had been Chalcedonian, mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. if he had written a letter to, to the Patriarch of Alexandria, might he have also called him, addressed him, Pontifex? Had he written in Latin to the Patriarch had, of Alexandria? Had he written in Latin? And yes. <laughs> um, very interesting point, very valid point. Um, uh, I can defend myself by saying it was only an attempt on our side. site. You're right, it is the Emperor Justin writing in the plural. Uh, so uh, was the letter only specifically directed to Hormizdas or also others? We don't know. That's the easy way out. Um, I could totally imagine that he might have meant the patriarchs, but there are also other indications which I probably should have brought in also where Hormizdas uh, refers to himself as just singular, Pontifex, where others also refer to him singular as Pontifex, doesn't exclude the others, but at the same time, uh, slowly, slowly, uh, over the course of time, and as I said, 4th century Damasus, 5th century Leo, 
6th century Hormizdans, late 6th century, early 7th century, Gregory, Pontifex, Pontifex Maximus even, Gregory the Great calls himself Pontifex Maximus. That's a span of almost 200 years where we're not sure what's happening, where we can see, I'm convinced that Gratian is the last one who had the title, who dropped it. Theodosius never had it, or at least we don't have the evidence of Theodosius being Pontifex. Um, the fact that it's only Zosimus on your handout, that's the only source that we have talking about a renunciation of the title Pontifex Maximus by the Emperor Gratian, with a kind of joke in the middle, so like, ah, oh, the next one up is Maximus, the usurper, but at least we'll have another Pontifex Maximus. Um, and um, I think there's something there in Zosimus, and it is a historical, I would call it a historical fact. Um, but the reason why Gratian dropped it, not sure. I think it's a language thing. Uh, all of a sudden, in the Vulgate translation, of the Bible, you find Christ being specified as Pontifex. If Christ is Pontifex, which mortal can be Maximus? So drop a title. Alan Cameron totally disagrees. Alan Cameron says title changes, which effectively means that nothing changes, because he says it changes from Pontifex Maximus to Pontifex Inclitus, which is a change in itself already, because you go from Maximus to well-known, prestigious, yada, yada, yada. Um, However, you see, and I, I mentioned them flirtations, Damas uses it, but it's almost as if it's slap, stop, no more. Leo tries, doesn't really get away with it. It doesn't, it's not institutionalized. So it could very well be, uh, and here I agree, it could very well be that others are also called Pontifex. It's not institutionalized specifically to Rome, but flirting with it and attempting to obtain it, uh, and then finally, a few decades later, to actually be the Maximus, um, somehow suggests. I'm only saying suggests. I'm like, you know, this is, I can't, uh, but it suggests that the bishops of Rome are trying really, really hard. Nowadays, you walk to St. Peter's, you stand in that beautiful square, boom full on the facade, here we are. Yeah? Uh, it's not the Church of Christ, it's the Church of Paul V, uh, of the Borghese fa <coughs> family. But you know, up, up to that point, up to the 6th and the 7th, and probably even beyond, even after Gregory the I, uh, it reeks of institutional, but it's still not. It depends on the figure, it depends on the person. Papa, different ball game, uh, that's something that you need to earn. Yeah. You deserve the title Papa, yes or no. It's not institutional. <coughs> um, and so it's unclear, but I kind of, you know, th there are others also addressing Hormizdas uh, specifically as Pontifex. And so it could be that it's something that he fancies. Not sure. Okay. Is there any evidence within the letters in the collection to show uh, editing of the letters to show one side being weaker or stronger than the other? Mm -hmm. I mean, in these two letters, the, the, the letter and the response, uh, the emperor is just telling uh, the pope that here I am, I am the emperor, mm -hmm. let's work yeah. together. Yeah. And then the, 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 in the response, he's talking about all kinds of things that do not appear. In, mm -hmm. in the original letter, he's sending uh, the, the, his, his, uh, his uh, answers uh, through his son, and, <coughs> and uh, he's offering them up to his cl to the emperor's clemency. And mm -hmm. uh, these these uh, these are as if there was some sort of demand in the original letter that was was, was dropped no. out or, or something of the sort. Is there any sign of systematic editing? Not in the actual collection as a whole. Um, so what we do have practically is a gigantic heap of text. Uh, what also what we do have is just two 11th century manuscripts uh, and a few later ones, but okay, fine. The 11th one, the, the two 11th century manuscripts are the <coughs> oldest we have. Um, perhaps one of the group that I'm working with uh, is going to try to figure out whether he can trace origins of the earliest 
manuscript to somewhere in northern Italy to maybe we don't know um, the collection as a whole has not been edited the documents themselves already back at the time uh, may very well have been you know and and I think in the in the case of Hormizdas response to Justin flattery an enormous amount of flattery and just you know pomp and circumstance build it up uh, and send the letter back to the emperor here you go I have the question I don't understand if you say uh, the collector has uh, the intention to strengthen <coughs> the position of Rome mm -hmm. why is a few from Leo Leo is uh, the best argument for Rome why only five letters sure if you want really strength of position <coughs> I missed really uh, there are other collections that have all the evidence of Leo. So there's, there's a case for the Collectio Avalana that the collector of the Avalana uh, just wanted to bring everything else in which was not found in other places in other collections. And so uh, to again bring in all the letters from Leo, unnecessary, they're there already. So that's why. Because these, these five of Leo are only in the Avalana nowhere else so that's material that was missed somewhere else and that he felt that had to be included and there you have it thanks everybody for coming Shalom.